Hi, I'm Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon from Pennsylvania's 5th Congressional District. And today I wanted to share with you one of my family's favorite picture books. It's called The Other Side by Jacqueline Woodson and the illustrator is E.B. Lewis. And one of the reasons it's one of my family's favorite books is because we know the artist, Earl Lewis. We met him years ago. And when he was chosen to illustrate this wonderful book, our daughter, Casey, became a model for one of the characters in the book. So with that, let's read the other side. That summer, the fence that stretched through our town seemed bigger. We lived in a yellow house on one side of it. White people lived on the other. And Mama said, don't climb over that fence when you play. She said it wasn't safe. That summer, there was a girl who wore a pink sweater. Each morning, she climbed up on the fence and stared over at our side. Sometimes I stared back. She never sat on that fence with anybody that girl didn't. Once, when we were jumping rope, she asked if she could play. And my friend Sandra said no, without even asking the rest of us. I don't know what I would have said. Maybe yes, maybe no. That summer, everyone and everything on the other side of that fence seemed far away. When I asked my mama why, she said, because that's the way things have always been. Sometimes when me and mama went downtown, I saw that girl with her mama. She looked sad sometimes, that girl did. Don't stare, my mama said. It's not polite. It rained a lot that summer. On rainy days, that girl sat on the fence in a raincoat. She let herself get all wet and acted like she didn't even care. Sometimes I saw her dancing around in puddles, splashing and laughing. Mama wouldn't let me go out in the rain. That's why I bought you rainy day toys, my mama said. You stay inside here where it's warm and safe and dry. But every time it rained, I looked for that girl and always, I always found her somewhere near the fence. Someplace in the middle of the summer, the rain stopped. When I walked outside, the grass was damp and the sun was already high up in the sky. And I stood there with my hands up in the air. I felt brave that day. I felt free. I got close to the fence and that girl asked my name. Clover, I said. My name's Annie, she said. Annie Paul, I live over yonder, she said. By where you see the laundry, that's my blouse hanging on the line. She smiled then. She had a pretty smile. And then I smiled and we stood there looking at each other, smiling. It's nice up on this fence, Annie said. You can see all over. I ran my hand along the fence. I reached up and touched the top of it. A fence like this was made for sitting on, Annie said. She looked at me sideways. My mama said, I shouldn't go on the other side, I said. My mama says the same thing, but she never said nothing about sitting on it. Neither did mine, I said. That summer, me and Annie sat together on that fence. And when Sandra and them looked at me funny, I just made believe I didn't care. Hello, my name is Carla Schmidt. I'm an education librarian at Penn State, and I'm the director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, which is an affiliate of the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress. And I have the pleasure today of visiting with Jacqueline Woodson about her 2001 title, The Other Side, illustrated by E.B. Lewis. Pennsylvania's representative from the 5th District 
Mary Gay Scanlon chose this book to read and share with all of us as part of the Library of Congress's initiative, Read Around the States. She said it's one of her favorite books and it's always been one of mine. So welcome, Jacqueline. Thanks, Carla, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I need to start out by telling you that I was one of the um, committee members who chose Brown Girl Dreaming with the American Library Association as a cybered honor book in 2016. And that serving on that committee was one of the highlights of my career in education. Uh, it's part of why I'm so happy to visit with you today uh, in this virtual format that we find ourselves in. Uh, just really a super highlight. It's been 20 years since The Other Side was published, and I was struck by what you said in your author's note of the 10th anniversary edition of the book. And if it's okay, I'm going to quote you. And I happen to have behind me, my, my edition happens to be the 10th edition. You said, each time I pick up The Other Side and begin reading it to young people, I see in their faces their own eagerness to knock down the fences in their lives. And I'm filled with such an amazing sense of hope and pride. Who knows what their worlds will be like when the other side turns 20, 30, 50, imagine, end quote. So what do you think? Has the world changed in hopeful ways in the last 20 years? <laughs> Have real and metaphorical fences continued to be knocked down or are they still being built? Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you for uh, the Seabird honor. Is this is Seabird or Cybert, right? Cyber, yes. Cybert, yes. That, yeah. that was such a gift and such a surprise and such a thrill to get that call and get that information about Brown Girl Dreaming. So yes, all these years. Oh, we loved, we loved your memoir. It just uh, touched our hearts. Thank you. Yes, yes. And the other side is really 20 years old. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that kind of blows my mind because it feels like I wrote it yesterday, but um, well, at least a week ago. In <laughs> terms of the fences, it's interesting because I think both things are happening. I think, um, you know, fences are getting knocked down all over the place and people, we, we see it now with the revolution going on and the, the um, fight for the visibility and, and the respect uh, for black lives. We see it now with um, people coming together, ho hopefully more and more as allies against all the Asian violence, anti-Asian violence that's going on. Um, and, and we see people saying, we're not taking this anymore. And what I see here young kids saying is this world that you're leaving to us, we are not giving to our grandchildren. You know, so they they're mad, they're done with, they're done with the racism, they're done with all the homophobia, the transphobia, you know, the classism and all of these ways in which our country still has work to do. And then we see the fences trying to get built around voter suppression all over this country. And we see people working to knock those fences down. We are now seeing the healthcare disparity in the age of this pandemic and, um, and those fences that we, many of us didn't even know existed to the enormity that they did uh, and people fighting against that. And um, so there's so many ways in which um, the work people as they have always been. People have been building fences and people have been working to knock them down. And my dream is to get everyone on the side of knocking down the fences as opposed to continuing to build them. Even in the disparity around education, we're seeing mm -hmm. that in this pandemic, there are kids who don't have the devices they need to just be able to get educated, which supposedly is our American right, right? So, right. Um, so it, it, it's, it's challenging to watch it at play from this um, perspective, and I, I remain hopeful. Yeah, we ha I think we have to be hopeful because, you know, some of the news that we're seeing even currently is so discouraging. It, 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 and so to know that there's folks out there doing everything they can to keep some of these things um, that are, are suppression, um, mm -hmm you know, doing everything they can to keep it from happening. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of a complex um, 
situation, I guess. And I wish I wish it was just uh, exactly like the other side. <laughs> <laughs> that you know that we can come together absolutely mm -hmm. um the in the story both of these little girls clover and annie say that their mothers said that they shouldn't go on the other side of the fence and part of what i really like is the logic of these little girls because it strikes me as exactly what real children would think and say they conclude that their mothers didn't say anything about sitting on the fence. They obey their mothers, but they also show resistance in a subtle but powerful way. It's a real pivotal moment in the story. How did you come up with that idea that the girls could get around their mother's wishes but still follow their letter of the law <laughs> by sitting on that fence? It's, it's um, you know, it's interesting because I think what I remember is working with the, first of all, thinking about that, um, the metaphor of sitting on the fence, that metaphor is that you're being like Aaron Burr, right? You're not taking a side, you're not taking a stand, you're just like, I'm just going to see what happens and, you know, I'm not going to engage in any way and I'm going to be passive about this. And so as I was thinking about that, it was, I thought, okay, I, in this book, I want to show that these two girls are activists, that they are, they're working toward change. And, and I, that fence is not going, they, they don't have the physical strength to knock that fence down. If they defy their parents, then there's that kind of moral question as an author of what message am I sending the world and to young people about listening to their parents? Because I think a lot of times parents are right. And I think young people have, as you said, historically been subversive in some way and have figured out a workaround. And, and in this case, these girls knew that they were right, um, that they shouldn't be separated because of a, of a law, because of a fence, and um, that they were going to change the world. And that was the way, you know, sitting on that fence. And it made so much sense, especially for young people. It's like, yeah, you can sit here, you can engage, you can play your games and all of this. And eventually someone's gonna to move to one side or the other of it. And I try to not be, um, not say, oh, this person went to the, Clover went to that Annie side or Annie went to Clover side. I left that question up because I wanted it to be part of a bigger conversation. Um, and I wanted to show that in them sitting on the fence, they took the power out of that fence, you know? So they didn't have to physically take it down, but they took yeah. away that fence's power to separate. Yeah, they were very clever. <laughs> As kids are. Yes, absolutely. You know, and that's, to me, that was just so realistic. Mm -hmm. Realistic. So um, I also really like the illustrations in the story. They are realistic watercolor renderings. And I feel like the clothing depicted sets the story maybe in the 19, 1950s or early 1960s. Maybe even earlier, I'm not, I'm not positive. Yeah, it looks like around the 50s. Okay, the 50s. So I wondered if E.B. Lewis decided the time period or did you suggest that time period to him? Did you two have any kind of a conversation? With each other? Um, you know, I get to choose my illustrators and once I choose them, we're not supposed to talk at all. Like we talk through the editor and the art director, but um, he's you know, my illustrators, they're not allowed to influence my words, right? They're not allowed to say, well, I think you should change this word to that or maybe get rid of this scene because they're illustrators. They're not always writers. And I'm, right. I am not an illustrator, so I can't um, say this is what I think you should do. But, and that said, in my head, I saw the other side as a story taking place in present day because I was going around the country and I would go into these classrooms that were all white. You know, I would go into classrooms that were all people of color. And I saw the way segregation still existed. I, you know, I went to neighborhoods where I was the only black person in the neighborhood. And this is the truth of our country. And so when I wrote The Other Side, it was to tell that story of present day segregation and the work we still have to do. Um, and then I saw Evie's illustrations and sketches and I was like, oh, their clothes look a little whack, but whatever, he'll fix it. <laughs> and it wasn't until I saw some of the full renderings, renderings that I was like, wait, he's setting this book back in the past. I don't want this. 
Um, mm -hmm. so, so I was, um, I'm like, how can we have this conversation if everyone's thinking, oh, this happened and then Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King and Rosa Parks came along and segregation was over. Um, but, you know, of course, if that had been a story of present day segregation, say in Brooklyn, New York, it would probably not be 20 years old now, right? Because I think one thing our country is able to do is talk about the past more so than they can talk about the present. And, and what he, Evie did in, in draw, setting it in the past is he, he opened the door for the conversation. So I walk in this room, everyone's engaged in this book because it feels safe because it was this thing that happened in the past. And then we can begin to ask the questions about, well, has this changed? Has that changed? You know, where do you see the fences in your, in your world and all of that? So in the end, it was an actual gift that he gave me. What I ended up having to do is go back then and change some of the language so it sounded more oh, cool. like language set in a uh, past time. It's like, that's my blouse hanging on the line, she said. And like, even the word blouse, people, kids don't say blouse anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I just tweaking some of the language to make it more, um, to make it work with the illustrations more was what I went back and did. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Interesting how that works. And, and what's nice about it is that you, you each have your own ownership for the work that you've done, and yet it, you made it all blend together so beautifully. Yeah. I think that one of the best things about this book is the discussion it evokes, mm -hmm. that it makes um, children in particular start to think yeah. in many different ways and to consider other viewpoints. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's what, uh, good picture book does, right? We don't want to be didactic. We don't want to try to teach oh a gosh. lesson. And we right. want people to think um, and, to, and, and to question. Um, I, I love yeah. that he separate the, say, separated the characters by the page, right? So throughout mm -hmm. the book, they're all on, they're, they're, Clover and Annie are on separate pages until they become friends. And from that point on, they're never on uh, separate pages again. They're always on the same page. And that was his wow. You know, I have things. to go back and look again yeah. because it didn't register in my brain cells exactly. And now you will never unsee it. <laughs> no, you're right. I won't unsee it. I absolutely won't. And what you just said kind of leads into my next um, comment that one of my favorite parts of the story is when Clover's mo mother tells her that she sees that she's made a new friend and her mother smiles and she's encouraging of the friendship. And I think in, in my mind, it shows that Clover's mother's made an important change mm -hmm. in her own thinking and her own stance of previously not pushing the boundaries of that fence. Mm -hmm. I, I just really feel like children can make a difference with adults. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting in me making that choice as a writer to have Clover's mother say that. Um, because as we see in today's America, it's about safety, right? We look at um, Breonna Taylor, we look at George Floyd, and we know that part of what parents, uh, Black parents were trying to do was keep their kids safe and yes. keep their kids alive. You look at Emmett Till, I mean, you look at the history of Black um, kids, die, black and brown kids dying in this country at the hands of white folks. And it's a very terrible history. So, so, you know, when she says that she, you know, I'm intentional, you made a new friend, like this is someone we can trust. This girl seems like she's going to be okay. And I'm going to take that step to let this thing happen, which is a chancy step, you know, who knows, you know, what could happen in that moment. And, um, but, but I did want to show the way um, parents take the chance because they don't want their kids to have to live their backstory, right? Like yeah. the world is yeah. and you have to let your kids change with the world. Right, right. And it's so lovely how all of Clover's friends joined them. Uh -huh. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's really nice. Um, finally, I guess, uh, as almost anyone who knows about you knows that you've experienced so many highlights in your career as a writer. You've had a numerous number of awards and great achievements that require all kinds of 
energy and many times huge time commitments. You know, I'm thinking about um, as an ambassador mm-hmm. for the uh, Library of Congress. I mean, that all the travel that you must have done with that. And so I wonder how you balance your writing life and your family life with honors that require that kind of a time commitment of travel and speaking engagements. And now that we've had the pandemic restrictions, has it changed in different ways? (laughs) It has changed in so many ways. Um, Just in terms of um, everything from how, it, it used to be that I would write because my family would leave the house by 7.30. By 7.30, my partner was on her way to work. My son was on his way to school. My daughter was on her way to school. Um, and from 7.30 to like six o'clock, I had all those hours to with the house to myself. And then, um, and it was just lots and lots of time to write. And then um, because of our, we were all in one place, we were all in Brooklyn. I was able to fly and travel and and do that kind of stuff. Um, and we 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 figured out we had it figured out and and we had it figured out so I never missed anything like a school play or a birthday or you know anything that was important to um, my family. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, we mostly moved up here to Brewster, New York, um, because we have more space. We can be outside. The dogs can run free. Um, we don't have to wear masks because there's no one around. And then, but we were all in this one house. And and so, and my son doesn't understand mommy's working. <laughs> He's like, I'm finished yeah. with school. Let me tell you what happened at school today. So those adjustments are still in the wake. And then my daughter went off to college, right? She's at Howard University Uh now, Um, but college was remote. So she moved back to Brooklyn and she was kind of trying to have her individual thing. So I think the gift of this pandemic is that I get to be in one place kind of, um, and I don't have to get on planes and I don't have to say goodbye to my family and I um, don't have to engage with them by a phone when I'm traveling. Um, And at the same time, we have had to shift as a family to understand. My partner, you know, uh, is seeing patients in one room, like you know, do, being um, remotely, and then my son's trying to do remote schooling, and then I'm doing Zoom, and and the Wi-Fi can't handle it. It's just, it's been a lot, and um, but the, it sounds like a lot of problem solving. It is constant, <laughs> constant, constant. Thanks for a fun afternoon for me. I know this is fun. It was so nice talking to you. So great to see you.